I'm Hal Lindsey. And I'm Cliff Ford, and this is the International Intelligence Briefing. Well, we've got a very special report tonight, I think, Cliff. It is kind of special. Well, good evening and welcome to the special report. The battle for Jerusalem, 4,000 years and counting. The most recent effort to hammer out an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians at Camp David collapsed in failure, as have all preceding efforts. The Israelis blame the Palestinians. The Palestinians blame the Israelis. Both sides accuse the U.S. of being biased for the other. And the stumbling block, as President Clinton announced at the summit as the summit collapsed, was Jerusalem. We all know how hard Jerusalem is. Always it comes down to Jerusalem. And when it does, it stops the peace process dead in its tracks. Why is this one dusty little city in the middle of a tiny country so valuable to both sides? Jerusalem has none of the qualities that explain the founding of a great city. It isn't by a seaport. It isn't on a river. It isn't on a trade route or caravan trail. It isn't on a major natural source of fresh water. It isn't strategically located for military defense purposes. There has been only one reason for the centuries of passion that have been lavished upon it. Jerusalem's earliest history ties it to the realm of the Spirit and God. It was first mentioned in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, circa 2000 BC, as being the home of Melchizedek. He was the mysterious but great priest of the Most High God to whom even Abraham bowed and gave tithes. Melchizedek city was then called Salem, or peace. After this, it was the home of a fierce people called the Jebusite. Many of these people were giants standing more than eight feet tall. Even Joshua and Caleb could not drive them out. So until King David, the city was called Jebus, and Israelites lived there under their rule. David finally defeated the Jebusites with an amazing victory in spite of their heavy fortifications and huge warriors. Psalm 24 records how the Jebusites taunted David and his army and mocked the God of Israel. That was their big mistake. David entreated Israel's God to enable him to defeat them and he did. So a little over 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, David established it as the eternal capital of Israel by God's command. The city that had been called Jebus and Salem became Jerusalem, the city of peace. Yerushalayim, as the Jew calls it, is often called the city of David. It was King David of Israel who, on instructions from God, bought a threshing floor for 600 shekels of gold, and this was from Arnon, the Jebusite. Arnon was willing to donate the land, but David insisted wisely on paying the full price for a cleared title for what is today the most strategic 35 acres on earth, the Temple Mount. It was on this site David built an altar and offered burnt offerings, and it was on this same site that his son Solomon was directed to build God's temple. Jerusalem became the one place on earth where God's manifest presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. This is why the city is much more than a plot of earth, or stones, or buildings, or culture, or an ancestral traditions to the sons of Israel. Without Jerusalem, Judaism has no ultimate meaning. Without Jerusalem, Israel's God has no place for meeting with His people. Indeed, without Jerusalem, the chosen people feel there's no validity to their existence. This is almost an impossible burden for any city to bear, yet this is the burden that is forever a part of the legacy of Jerusalem. And so it has remained for 3,000 years, ever since its founding by Israel's greatest king, Love for this city and all it represents preserved the Israelites as a unique and peculiar people down through the centuries of dispersion. 
Every year in the homes of the diaspora, Jews the world over, Passover ended with the prayer, next year in Jerusalem. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple completely. The gold that decorated it melted down between the massive stones of the temple itself. For the soldiers to get at the gold inside, they virtually dismantled it, piece by piece. Thus was Jesus' prophecy of 37 years earlier literally fulfilled. He said, quote, not one stone will be left standing on another, end quote. The temple, the seat of God's earthly throne, was lost to the Jews. It was now the time of the Gentiles. All that remained was the hope of next year in Jerusalem. Ironically, the city has experienced little of that for which it was named. Peace has been more of a prayer and a hope than a reality. What Jesus predicted about the interim condition of Jerusalem from its Roman destruction until its return to the Israelites at the time of his second coming became literally fulfilled. Listen to Jesus' prophecy, quote, And they, Israel, shall fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, end quote. Luke 21, verse 24. In Jerusalem's early history, it was caught between the conquest ambitions of the great empires of antiquity. Israel sits in the middle of a land bridge that connects three continents. Anyone who wants to build an empire that embraces Asia, Africa, and Europe has to conquer the key span in the middle of that bridge, Israel. And since its capital is Jerusalem, it came in for one siege after another. The Assyrians, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans all in turn sounded their war trumpets at the gates of Jerusalem. God miraculously delivered Jerusalem many times. However, their greatest danger was never from without, but from within. Because of Israel's frequent departure from faith in their God, he brought upon Jerusalem a destruction about which his prophets had long warned them. This happened twice in their history, exactly fulfilling the prophetic warnings they had been given. In the long period since Jerusalem's second destruction by the Romans, the battle for Jerusalem has become the flashpoint of a 4,000-year-old conflict. The age-old family feud between two half-brothers whose father was Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac has exploded upon our current scene and drugged the whole world into it. The Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. They have always believed that the Israelites cheated them out of their inheritance. About A.D. 622, this deep age-old resentment became part of a new religion that was started by one of Ishmael's sons, Muhammad. The religion of Islam is intensely woven around the Arab culture and passions. So wherever Islam has been embraced, Ishmael's passionate hatred toward the Jew has been embraced with it. Many years after Muhammad's death, some teachers of Islam began to claim something that would bind the religious passions of all Muslims to Jerusalem forever. A myth was created that Muhammad and his horse were miraculously flown to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem on the night of his death. Muhammad ascended to heaven, according to this, on his horse from the rock on which Abraham had been willing to sacrifice his son. And of course, they believed that the son was Ishmael, not Isaac. Based on this teaching, Jerusalem is the third holiest site in Islam. Only Mecca and Medina are seen as more important. The blood that has been spilled because of this fervent belief is beyond calculation. And yet the past is merely prelude to the blood that is soon to be spilled over this same issue. According to the prophet Zechariah, this ancient conflict between Ishmael and Isaac over Jerusalem 
will be the fuse that starts the last war of the world. And now that this issue has been made part of both Islam and Judaism, solving it is impossible. Muslims believe to give Israel Jerusalem is to confess that the Quran and the Hadith, the holiest teaching of Islam, are wrong. Israelis believe that to give up Jerusalem is the same as saying their holy Bible is wrong and that all of their sufferings in exile were for nothing. Islam's entire claim to Jerusalem is based on the Quran, despite the fact that Jerusalem isn't mentioned even once in that entire book. By contrast, Israel's religious and historical claim is well documented. The city figures prominently in the Old Testament, being mentioned more than 600 times. On the other hand, the Muslim claim to the city is based on Surah 17.1, which refers ambiguously to Al-Quds, which means the furthest mosque. Surah 17.1 says, and I quote, Glory be to Allah, who did take his servant for a journey at night from the sacred mosque to the furthest mosque, end quote. Many Muslims, especially in the North African countries, do not even know the name Jerusalem. They call it Al-Quds. All Islam's claim to Jerusalem are based on this one reference to the furthest mosque. But what is the evidence to support the position that either the Dome of the Rock Mosque or the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem is the Al-Quds, or furthest mosque, referred to in the Quran? Well, the prophet Muhammad died in 632 A.D. At the time of his death, Jerusalem was under occupation by the Byzantine Empire. When Muhammad died, there were no mosques in Jerusalem. On the Temple Mount stood a Christian church, the Church of St. Mary of Justinian. For Muhammad to have ascended to heaven on a winged steed, he would have had to ride that horse into a Christian church and ascend to heaven from a Christian altar. Now, that's an unthinkable act to a Muslim. Well, Cliff, I think you're really right on that one. I mean, uh, uh, it was a little startling as we investigated this to find those facts out, wasn't it? It certainly was, Hal. It really